there are stories that seem to become lost between legend and reality. One of these stories concerns Sagicina, a town about 38 kilometers from the outskirts of Sofia in Bulgaria. Here, where time seems to stand still even today, and where it is possible to admire a harsh and uncontaminated landscape, in December 1990, some Bulgarian soldiers fenced off an area of land inhabited by just a few local farmers. Thanks to the help of some excavators and the workforce alone, in a couple of years, tons of earth were dug up in search of something, and the town quickly became one of the most important centers of interest in modern ufology, even obtaining the title of the European Area 51. But it wasn't just soldiers who participated in this operation. Mediums and psychics, able to communicate with unknown energies, also played a fundamental role. There was one in particular whose notoriety bordered on becoming a global phenomenon. The name that stands out among these events is that of Baba Venga, a woman with extraordinary clairvoyant skills who was able to communicate with alien spirits and entities, revealing to us that there is a dimension where not all truths are visible to human eyes. Loved in her country of origin to such an extent as to cause a veil of nostalgia in the eyes of those who knew her and contested all over the world for her strong declarations, she had a life that was far from simple but full of amazing encounters. And thus begins our journey through time. Baba Vanga was born prematurely in Strumica on January the 31st, 1911, in the territories of the then Ottoman Empire or today's North Macedonia. In the first hours of her life, her parents, Pando Surchev e Parashkeva Surcheva, refused to give her a name because, according to local tradition, it was necessary to be sure of the survival of the newborn child in order to be able to establish one. When the baby girl cried for the first time, however, a hospital midwife, as if driven by a magnetic force, felt the duty to go against all forms of local superstition, and in the freezing winter afternoon of that day, took to the streets with the baby in her arms. Some of the passers-by stopped, curious to know why the woman was there, and when the midwife explained that she was looking for a name for the baby, they gave her some suggestions. The first name that was recommended was Andromaha, which means she who fights men, but it was rejected because it was too Greek, which didn't bode well given the anti-Hellenic sentiment of the time. A second passerby instead recommended the name Vangelia, which means good news, and this was immediately accepted. Days went by, and the little girl showed signs of being extremely combative in the face of life's adversities, so her name was registered as Vangelia Pandeva Dimitrova. But the people didn't just give her a name. Due to a strange twist of fate, three years later, the events that followed indelibly marked Vangelia's future, forcing her to receive care and charity from her friends and relatives for the rest of her life. Her father, Pando Sulchev, a militant of the IMRO, the Internal Macedonian Revolutionary Organization, a revolutionary movement of national liberation in the territories of the then Ottoman Empire, was drafted into the Bulgarian army in 1914 to participate in the First World War, while his wife fell ill and died of unknown causes some months after his departure. When Sulchev returned following the end of the war, the town of Strumica had passed from Bulgarian to Serbian control and he was arrested by the local authorities for illegal activities in support of Bulgaria, also confiscating all his family's property, who then lived in poverty for many years. Despite the economic difficulties and her tender age, Vangelia's childhood was serene and she grew up showing a marked intelligence. But together with these precious characteristics, her propensities towards the world of the paranormal also began to manifest themselves. 
Through a game she invented called Healing, the little Vangelia impersonated a healer and pretended to invent herbal cures for her friends who pretended to be sick. But one day, the fatality of destiny changed her life forever. Her father remarried and therefore gave his daughter a stepmother. Everything seemed to return to normality once more, but on a bright day, while she was playing in the fields, something unpredictable happened. A tornado lifted her off the ground, carrying her up into the air until she disappeared into the sky. The witness accounts after she was found left everybody deeply disturbed. Vangelia was terrified. Her eyes were so covered in sand and dust that she couldn't open them anymore without suffering intense pain. Once she was brought back home, her parents tried to do everything possible to save her eyesight, but the money they had only allowed a partial operation, and at the age of 12, Vangelia's world went dark forever. Despite this terrible condition, she continued her studies. In 1925, she enrolled in a school for the visually impaired in the city of Zemun in the Kingdom of Yugoslavia, where she learned to read braille, perform small household chores, such as sewing, cooking and cleaning, and even learned to play the piano. In a short time, Vangelia demonstrated that she possessed excellent practical skills and an incredible memory. Unfortunately, her experience didn't last long, because following the death of her stepmother, she was forced to interrupt her studies and return home. Vangelia had to take care of her younger siblings, and due to the economic conditions the family was suffering, she began to work every day. At around 16 years old, she had her first vision. Thanks to some sheep that had been stolen from her family, her father understood that Vangelia could look at the world around her without really seeing it. The girl saw in her mind the place where the sheep had been hidden, as if they were there, right in front of her eyes. Her incredulous father, a few hours later, returned with the sheep, and from that moment on, he realized that Vangelia was able to see the future. This ability of hers improved day by day, until it stabilized at the age of 30. In this period, and until after the Second World War, Vangelia, now well known as Baba Venga, attracted many followers, convinced of her healing and clairvoyant abilities. A vast number of people visited her, some hoping for help in tracing relatives lost during the war, others to find the place where their loved ones may have died, still others to heal the horrific wounds caused by the fighting, thanks to her herbal medicine practices. All of them returned to her at least once to thank her or offer her something in return for her services, and her loving soul was forever engraved in the memory of those who met her. Inevitably, the voice of the people spread, and on April the 8th, 1942, even Sal Boris III visited her to ask for a consultation, probably driven by fears caused by the Second World War. Bulgaria only managed to obtain the Dobruja region thanks to the tacit support of the Third Reich, and the Tsar was thus forced to ally with the Germany-Italy axis. On that particular occasion, Vanga only told the Tsar to remember a certain date, the 28th of August. The following year, exactly on the 28th of August 1943, the Tsar died of poisoning, an event that occurred under mysterious circumstances. The case of Tsar Boris III caused Baba Vanga's fame to expand so much that she received visits from everywhere, common people and dignitaries, as well as Bulgarian politicians from various Soviet republics, who increasingly began to ask for her services. One of these, the most famous, even if it is an unverified event, was the meeting with Leonid Brezhnev, General Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union and de facto head of the USSR from 1964 
1982. But the thin veil of time revealed much more to the woman, who, although semi-illiterate and blind, somehow predicted many events, some of which came true many years after her death. One of these in particular even led to her arrest. In 1952, she declared before the Soviet powers that she knew that on March the 5th, 1953, Stalin would die. However, seeing as Bulgaria was also a communist country at the time, Vanga was seen as a threat and imprisoned. Stalin died precisely on March the 5th, 1953, from a brain hemorrhage, and the woman was freed. But she didn't just make predictions related to the countries of the Soviet Union. Some of them mentioned events of a global order. In 1980, the woman pronounced a new and chilling vision she had seen. These are her exact words. Kursk will be submerged in water and the whole world will shed tears for the event. To the eyes of the world, it was considered an impossible event given that Kursk is located almost 600 kilometers from the sea coast. Yet, 20 years later, the prophecy came true in a truly remarkable way. On the 12th of August, in the year 2000, the Russian nuclear submarine Kursk sank in the Barents Sea, killing 118 people on board and becoming one of the largest naval disasters in Russian history. Nobody, up until that moment, would have believed such a thing possible, but the news spread quickly around the world and the power of Baba Vanga was associated with that of Nostradamus. A few years later, in 1989, Baba spoke of an event that at the beginning of the new millennium would threaten world peace, and many, again, did not fully understand the meaning of her words. This is what she said. Horror! Horror! Our American brothers will fall after being attacked by steel birds. Wolves will howl in a bush and innocent blood will flow. Even today, the media often quote Baba Vanga, linking many of her predictions to true events, some of which include the rise of ISIS, China's rise to power, the fatal tsunami that killed 220,000 people in Southeast Asia in 2004, and many others that are just as frightening and hopefully will never come to pass. Like that of the dissolution of the Soviet Union more than 40 years ago, and though still unclear what she is referring to, saw Putin emerge as a prominent leader. All will thaw like ice, only one will remain intact, the glory of Vladimir, the glory of Russia. Too much is held within one victim. Nobody can stop Russia. Everything will be removed from its way and will not only be kept, but will also become the Lord of the world. There are also alleged predictions of numerous and major disasters that will affect us starting from 2023. Enormous cataclysms, meteorites colliding with the Earth, the shifting of the Earth's axis, terrible solar storms and a worldwide ban on births, imposed specifically because of the developments of these difficult situations. Apocalyptic events that would have the power to change human consciousness by subjugating us and significantly diverting the parable of our evolution. But that's not all. In fact, Vanga allegedly revealed that starting from 2183, events of global and universal interest would see the human community linked to that of the alien one. Human colonies on Mars, an overt alien contact, and an abandoned spacecraft on planet Earth that could spawn a new disease, causing instantaneous aging. But Vanga looked even further into the future. 4304. A solution will be found to overcome any disease. 
4308. Due to the mutation, people will finally start using their brain more than 34% of its capacity, and they will completely lose the notion of evil and hatred. 4509. Knowing God, man will finally reach a level of development so advanced that he can communicate with God. 4599. The human race will achieve immortality. 4674. The development of civilization will reach its peak. The number of people living on different planets is approximately 340 billion. Assimilation with aliens begins. 5076. A border universe. With it, no one knows. 5078. The decision to leave the confines of the universe, while about 40% of the population is against it. 5079. The end of the world. It is not certain how many and which of the prophecies that came true later could actually have been attributed to Baba's words. There are no official documents that cite her, but only the testimonies of followers and enthusiasts, on blogs and in newspaper articles. On this basis, it is therefore also possible that part of these predictions have been artfully created in order to give greater visibility to this figure, or as in the case of the prediction regarding Russia, to obtain favorable treatment from the powerful elements in office in the governments of the ex-Soviet bloc. These are only theories, but one thing is certain. With the fame obtained by her foresight, Vanga even managed to override the imposition of the local Orthodox clergy's bodies of power. Continuing into the 90s, in fact, with the proceeds from her clairvoyant activities and the donations of those who supported her, she built a church in the city of Petrich as a place of worship. This event created quite an amount of friction within the clergy, who had no intention of consecrating the strange building. The structure did not have an altar, a dome or a place to pray, and the ornaments present were a series of portraits of saints painted by Svetlin Rusev, a Bulgarian artist famous for his experimental art. Eventually, however, fearing the wrath of her followers or possible political patrons, church leaders agreed to consecrate the building. On the 11th of August 1996, Vangelina died of complications related to breast cancer. Her funeral is attended by a large crowd and in accordance with Vanga's will, her house in Petrich becomes a museum which opens its doors to visitors from all over the world on May the 5th, 2008. In the course of her life, Vanga not only made statements about future events, she also claimed that the abilities she possessed were linked to something non-terrestrial, non-human. According to her words, all the prophecies were caused by the presence of creatures invisible to our eyes, but not to hers. Creatures whose provenance she could never clearly explain. These entities could give her information about people and would never transmit it directly to the interested parties, because, for these aliens, distance and time do not exist, unlike that which is true for normal human beings. For Vanga, the life of all those who were in front of her was like a film which projected from birth until death and would lead her to remote or future times, where none of the events could ever have been changed, even under her own will. Thanks to her abilities, the Soviet leaders reserved extreme tolerance for her activities as a clairvoyant, a non-indifferent fact, given that the communist government persecuted all those who declared themselves as clairvoyants, or at least tried to prevent their fame from expanding, seeing in clairvoyance a superstition from the past to be eradicated. 
Thus, Vanga was not only tolerated and loved, but she became the only fortune teller supported by the Soviet Socialist Republic. But who, or what, are these entities? In the 90s, the years in which Vanga tried to bring her church to light in Petric, the woman participated in a military mission where the energies she often spoke about seemed to manifest themselves almost daily. Zarichina is where that particular operation took place, which made it forever indelible in the chronicles of world ufology. Codename Sunray Project The Sunray Project is the operation that took place from the 6th of December 1990 to the 19th of November 1992 in the subsoil of Sarichina. The project, which started with the intention of finding a lost treasure, the treasure of Tsar Samuel, over the course of two years transformed into an underground search for extraterrestrial life. In order for the mission, led by the Ministry of Defence, to be successful, the military recruited three people with extraordinary psychic powers, including clairvoyance, communication with the spirit world, and healing. The mediums, Elisaveta Longinova, Dora Petkova, and Dimitar Surakov, were summoned to take part in the project from its earliest days. But before even getting close to the exact point where the excavation should have started, Longinova felt a strong state of malaise, and when she set foot in the village for the first time, something unexpected happened. Longinova entered into direct communication with a strange energy, and pervaded by it, as if it had possessed her body, she indicated to the military the exact point where the operation would come to life. From that moment on, the feeling arose in the minds of the psychics that the research project would soon undergo a change, taking the military far from what they were expecting. The three were pervaded by a strange vibration, and as the earth was removed, they all found themselves facing sudden paranormal events and inexplicable technical incidents. After months of uninterrupted work, a 20 meter deep spiral tunnel was built, and the search never stopped until one of the soldiers opened up a passage into an empty area. With picks and hammers, they created a one meter wide opening in the rock face. By removing a few handfuls of earth and stones, the group found something amazing in front of them. A long, finely crafted corridor ran through the depths of that mysterious place. A patrol party was sent down the corridor to inspect it. The soldiers, happy to have finally found the path that would have surely led them to the Tsar's precious treasure, took only a few steps, but in that very short period of time, they were forced to change their minds. They went down the tunnel until, having reached a strange and large triangular monolith of black stone set in the rock, they found the passage almost completely blocked. Nothing was written on the stone, and the substance of which it was composed of emitted a strange light, to the point that the object made those present believe it was immaterial, unreal, a dream. Suddenly, the earth started to tremble. There was a blackout, and some of the battery-operated equipment, such as radios and cars in the area, went off and on again for no reason. For a long period of time, there was interference on the radio frequencies. The soldiers tried to remove the strange triangular monolith, but discovered that the material it was made of was impossible to scratch or penetrate. They tried so many times that they started to believe it was wrapped in something. An energy shield. It was possible to touch something very thin on the stone, but there was no way they could feel the rock surface under their fingers. The next day, the three psychics incessantly interviewed the local population and built up a collection of testimonies from the inhabitants. Several versions of the event were told, 
but one element links all of them together. During the night, people saw something out of the ordinary. Swift balls of light flying over the hills of the town. Some of them told of bizarre bipedal beings who under the cover of darkness roamed near the security perimeter, a detail also reported later by the military who more than once found themselves pointing weapons and torches at humanoid figures hidden in the midst of the shrubs who were able to dematerialize as soon as they were bathed by the torchlight. Then a strange and worrying testimony was added which found positive response among all those present. A deep voice, the same night in which the strange corridor was found, resounded through the whole town, pervading it. Colonel Svetko Kanev, after listening to the report collected by the mediums, decided to continue the excavations, but they would take place only under the indications of the group of psychics. This was the part of the facts that led Baba Vanga, now in her 80s, to face the long journey from Petric to Tsagicina. Her goal was to clarify the situation and reassure the people who were participating in the operation. Convinced of being able to find out what was behind the rocks in that kind of underground temple, Vanga would have directed the heart of the operation in a less invasive way leading the mediums to contact the entity on a daily basis, to fully understand what it was. Through the means of connection with the spirit world, the psychics tried to contact with that energy. They succeeded, and from that moment on, legend has it that in the subsoil of Tsaricina, something much older than a simple treasure is hidden, something that could explain the origins of everything. Elisaveta Longinova, Dora Petkova and Imita Surakov, thanks to the support of Vanga and their psychotronic means, that is, through the reception of information in energy frequencies decoded by the brain, managed to get in touch with the entity that resides beyond the ancient corridor almost every day, and in particular Longinova began to write something similar to instructions in hieroglyphic form on some sheets of paper. The military, who had noticed the writing speed with which the sheets were being compiled, believed that part of the information given by Longinova could be true, and a few days later, the Ministry of Defence gave the order to General Minchev, head of the operation, to reorganise the group of mediums with the aim of interpreting all the information received and recording it, word by word, in a work diary. Slowly, and through the painstaking work of local and foreign translators, the meaning of all the writings became clearer. The information received concerned and combined old Bulgarian texts, hieroglyphics, Arabic, Indian, Southern Chinese and runic writings, some series of natural numbers, astrological signs and planets such as Saturn, Jupiter, Neptune and constellations such as Pisces and Capricorn. Longinova wrote more than 800 pages, and from what was able to have been translated, an event that took place 2,575 years earlier was spoken of, as well as a civilization that existed more than 8,000 years ago. Baba Vanga also added that this information was told by an entity that was anything but terrestrial. An alien, the first being to arrive on our planet physically defined as an androgynous creature, neither man nor woman. According to the story, this creature that tried to contact her came from a planet called Photon or Neodrina, which in human language can also be translated into light. This planet was destroyed in ancient times and now, under Saricina, dwells the body of one of the beings who was originally part of the supreme race from which all human beings were generated. Baba Vanga also defined the stone as a biological protection barrier and in her opinion its destruction could have caused very serious risks to the safety of everybody. Under the skepticism and fear of some, the military continued the deep excavations, encountering another barrier 
a kind of concave-shaped slab, and which, in the wall on its right, they found some stones assembled to form a humanoid figure. It wasn't clear whether this sort of statue was already there or had been formed during the works. The colonel said that a colleague tried several times to dig in a nearby area, but an invisible wall prevented him from continuing, and to everybody's dismay and fatigue, they were forced to temporarily interrupt the work. From the fragments of information gathered, the military did not exclude that some of the mysterious incidents that occurred during the research were caused by the hostility of a technology unfamiliar to them, or by the genetic activity of an intelligence much higher than that of humans. A statement that was apparently also found in the translations of Longinova's writings, where the entity underlined that our vision of life in the universe is too limited to be able to fully understand how it develops. Furthermore, for Vanga, the energy they could feel belonged to the skeleton of an alien buried there thousands of years ago. A gigantic skeleton. Vanga asked General Dinev what the thing they were searching for was, but above all, why he needed this thing they were searching for, given that the being that lived there was neither a man nor a woman. Then she asked the general, Well, Lubcho, what are you looking for? It is neither man nor woman. Yellow monkey, why do you need it? That day, about a hundred meters from the entity, the old woman advised a group of psychics to carry a handful of earth to leave in front of the stone. A handful of earth, probably an amulet, capable of permanently binding the mediums to the energy source. Or a symbolic gift, as the earth has a meaning related to the power of life, the rebirth of natural energy, protection, luck and love, as generally described in various manuals of magic. In a few days, Vanga ended up in many local newspapers. The excavation had finished, the Tsaricina hole was sealed with tons of stones and cement, and all the sea's documentation mysteriously disappeared. The defense minister, Nikolai Svinarov, made new statements years later. He admitted that the classified documents had been sent abroad, probably to lose track of them, since, if information about the first inhabitants of the Earth were obtained, our idea about the evolution of the species would have to completely change. The people, confused by conflicting news about the closure of Tsarichina, made several assumptions. Some argued that the reason was linked to the will of the military, others of the mediums, others still due to the too high cost of the mission, also given that the Bulgarian economy was in extreme difficulty following the fall of communism in the country. Longinova then tried to explain what happened in those days. For her, the group of psychics would never have advised to stop the excavations. On the contrary, everyone trusted Baba Vanga, and she could clearly perceive and see what the military were looking for. They too wanted to continue. Longinova was convinced that the writings were not just the result of paranoia, contrary to the opinion of the historian Bozida Dimitrov and Professor Dimitar Ovcharov, who claimed that they were nothing more than beautiful scribbles. According to Vanga, one day Longinova could have deciphered the writings. Something was trying to get in touch with them, and the old woman was sure of the direction they needed to take. Then she points out that the whole transcript of the conversation held with Vanga was recorded and classified by the Bulgarian Ministry of Defense, as well as all the other documents. But she remembered very little of the whole affair, probably also due to the influence of the intense moments they went through. With the visibility obtained thanks to the stories that spread throughout the country and later worldwide, there were other people who went to Stagicina, with the same abilities to connect to these energies. An example of this is the first-hand experience of a friend of Ivomir Dimichev, a world-renowned Bulgarian writer who has published a series of philosophy and self-help books dealing with the theory of cogitality. 
The objective of this theory would be to consciously manage one's energies in every field, establishing a sort of connection to cosmic frequencies which extend over a hologram reality. The story begins when Ivomir's friend, going to the Sagichina site, called him, quite shocked, reporting that all of a sudden he had started receiving hieroglyphics in automatic writing. As had happened for Longinova, the man constantly felt the urge to imprint strange texts on paper. He also happened to see some strange images in his mind and wanted to represent them. Ivomir then asked him if he could analyze the material. The things he saw surprised him. In front of those papers, the writer became quite sure. The energy he was trying to get in contact with was most likely the androgynous creature the legend tells of. In his opinion, all this was not the result of chance, but was manifesting itself through the cogital mind of his friend, who, by establishing a connection with the energy, could also have recovered the missing parts of what he himself had only partially discovered, because knowledge, he stressed, cannot disappear. The messages received from the entity were exactly what he was trying to explain through his book, and the same experiences lived by his friend were proof of this. The information that he, up until that moment, had only theorized was unquestionably finding a result. His friend was explained how to ask for the translations of the writings. A few days later, he called and reported in detail some information about the mysterious Megatron frequency. The following is an excerpt from the message received from the entity of Salichina. The Triple Helix is just the beginning of a new human evolution. The number of chromosomes will increase greatly and it is all already written in the human gene. One day, you too will master the low-frequency vibrations of the cell. With our arrival here, this frequency has decreased too much, so we have created this formula. The entity then reveals a formula for regulating the low-frequency potential of the cell. What the human being does not know is that he is responsible for this low vibration in the cells. Only this prevents the human race from destruction. On the one hand, it is very important for the functioning of the planet, while on the other, it is transferred to our generation to form the DNA triple helix and remove the barriers to lower frequencies. Even though the reason for the removal of these barriers is not clear, the entity goes on to tell the story of the planet it comes from and the secrets of the formula. Our world was doomed due to our stupidity and our playing with these energies that are responsible for almost the entire universe. The formula of the triple helix serves to find the spirit through a process of symbiosis and is still possible and available here on Earth and it is very important since the evolution of the human race depends on this symbiosis. The frequencies of the cell are in fact transmitted by the DNA in space. This transpersonal frequency allows all thoughts of people to be transmitted to a higher reality. Everything is like a receiving antenna which in no way eliminates the cognition and memory of the cell. A sort of universal memory, a cellular or atomic frequency memory. With the transpersonal low frequency, it will be possible for you to direct and master everything, such as gravity, as well as the human way of thinking and behaving. This is the one piece that is still missing in the puzzle of our descendants, humans. The current transformation can only be done by tuning the mind, cognitive abilities and knowledge of the cells, with what you call faith. This symbiosis will involve all known frequencies and those of which you are unaware. For the entity, the Megatron frequency has not yet been found by men, because it cannot be measured by our mere instruments. It can only be felt 
by someone who is very sensitive and listens. It would interact with all people who have discovered within themselves their own spiritual part and who would be easily able to manage it. Then the text changes to underline what the Megatron cell would look like. Like all frequencies, it would have a wave function and be connected to cells, as these are wave frequencies too. It would behave like a crystalline part of the cell, since it would have a completely invisible refractive function within the DNA and a particular detail is entered on how this frequency would be produced. The most important thing to know is that this frequency is controlled by the intuitive abilities of the individual. However, the management and the formula for achieving this control is a complex process. Then, also in the DNA chain itself, between the bonds, a part connected to the photons of light would be found. If you think of DNA as a double helix, as previously thought, you will find a small gap between the bond cuts, which vibrates at this megatron frequency and is located between the fifth and sixth bond of the formation, as a light, or what you call, photons. This frequency binding is very sensitive and is difficult to be seen. Nucleotron bonds, according to the entity, would be very important for the evolution of DNA. They would be controlled by a group of links located in the pineal gland. Furthermore, DNA would be mainly structured by light photons of pure coherence with a frequency close to the frequency of love, or well-being, and only through true love could genetic metamorphosis take place. When these new bonds in the DNA will take place, we will reach the low-frequency vibration symbiosis of the cell, coming from a planet called Neutrinia. The entity concludes the message by talking about this planet. Neutrinia was a very high-frequency planet, close to the DNA frequency of love. We have gone through the transition that you are now experiencing, and this is the reason we are giving you this information. To obtain the symbiosis of the cell, there are many steps to take, but this is only one of those that we will give you. This is the first one. Two days later, another message arrived. The entity underlines that to remove the so-called protection and stimulate the metamorphosis of the cells, one should let oneself be enveloped by the Megatron frequency by entering its osmosis through a meditative state. In particular, an oriental meditative technique is mentioned, in which the connection channels of the hands merge through the heart chakra, connected to the left hand, and the third eye chakra, or the pineal gland, connected to the right hand. The touch of one's hands, positioned on the chakras to which they belong, thanks also to intense desire and intentionality, would cause an energy vortex capable of generating an inner ray of light. This ray of light would start from the hip area, then releasing from the third eye and pervading the meditating subject with its own light, to the point of rejoining these energy channels, and subsequently releasing the energy of the Megatron cell. At this point, our blood would be able to generate new DNA replicas by fusing the helixes and separating the cells, or, in a nutshell, increase the multiplicative and regenerative capacity of the cells. Then there was a third shocking message that raises the question, could there be many other dimensions? In fact, this method recommended by the entity would not only have the aim of generating physical well-being, but also another type of connection. The third letter reveals that the meditative technique would be linked to the release of energies connected between human beings, the planet Earth and the universe. The whole universe. Each of us would function as a crystal lattice in which energy passes and where a series of mirrors reflect light in different directions and angles. Everything around us would function as a universal energy conductor lattice. Human beings would originally have been composed of a spectrum of light at many frequencies, 
but were given only one range of these so as not to cause a resonance in the lattice. With only one frequency range, the human being would therefore now have the possibility to explore only one dimension of the hologram, which would, in turn, interact with his personal essence without causing interference. Therefore, everything emits frequencies, but we distinguish only some extensions of these. The message of the entity then concludes with a particular detail. The emotions of human beings would be the only generator of energy capable of creating impressions on the observed reality. This statement is partly true. From a biological point of view, the heart is the center of the circulatory system, while the pineal gland, which is connected to the brain, takes care of the central nervous system and is responsible for the hormonal balance of our body. For some peoples, the pineal gland is considered the seat of the spirit. It is also the producer of a particular molecule called DMT, a substance that thousands of years ago was assumed by peoples of South America thanks to the consumption of ayahuasca, with which it would be possible to reach a hallucinatory state. It would intervene on emotional states such as happiness through the production of hormones such as melatonin. There is, therefore, very likely a link between the meditative state and the energy benefits generated by it, even if it is not known that this type of technique can actually affect our genetics or the healing of serious diseases. Despite this, it is well known that the human body generates a multitude of frequencies through the brain. It works like an electrical biological machine capable of decoding inputs and also involuntarily generating energy outputs, which are expressed through brain waves, discharging throughout the rest of the body. Brain waves are part of the electrical activity of the brain, and the stages of our consciousness are due to the incessant activity of these waves, which are electromagnetic waves. Different types of thought produce different vibrations, which are calculated in hertz, or cycles per second, and vary according to the type of activity the brain is engaged in. They are divided into delta, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma waves. Watching this video, for example, your brain is most likely producing beta waves. But what is the Sarichina being talking about? And what would the Megatron cell be? Analyzing the text thoroughly, when the Tsagichina alien talks about the Megatron cell, it would seem that it is talking about the biophotons discovered by quantum biology. So, according to the words of the being, is it therefore possible that these electric fields are due to molecules with a luminous component? According to the already mentioned quantum biology, yes, this is true. Subject of frequent discussions among scholars, for quantum biology, the human body is no longer considered simply as an organism controlled exclusively by biochemical reactions, but above all, by energy. As Dr. Fritz Albert Popp states, We are still on the threshold of fully understanding the complex relationship between light and life, but now we can strongly say that the function of our entire metabolism depends on biophotons. Just as the entity underlined that the most infinitesimal parts of us are composed of light through the Megatron cell, quantum biology would also highlight the same thing, but through low luminescence biophotons. All of us would be able to see matter thanks to the processes that take place between DNA and light. Human beings would in fact be composed of biological mechanisms, but above all of energy generated by the biophotons present within the DNA, which through their frequency would make it possible to see matter, because it itself generates low frequency light, or slight luminescence. Organizations such as Ego Crayonet, an NGO from Florence, Italy, which aim to study precisely these theories, bring together researchers from various traditional disciplines based on vital energy. Disciplines such as yoga, acupuncture, 
chronotherapy, laser therapy and osteopathy. Their aim is to overcome the current mechanistic setting of biophysical sciences and propose alternative solutions for medical research and treatment, including self-generative ones. According to the theory of the physicist Fritz Albert Popp, 90% of luminescent biophotons would be produced by the DNA of all living systems and would be found in the DNA-RNA bond as a sort of receiving transmitting antenna of photons. The chain of our genetic information would therefore no longer be just a mechanism caused by simple bonds of amino acids or proteins. Biophotons would be capable of remotely communicating information signals linked to the development and change of the human body, or morphogenesis, in all phases of life, from the fetus to the adult. Furthermore, these biophotons would regulate and favour an incisive action on the energy molecular balance, even going so far as to heal the individual psychophysically. However, to observe the bioquantum theory with different eyes, it is necessary to understand that even if it is impossible to see the photons, they react with the biophotons. But how? The photons generated by light reach the retina of the eye, activating rhodopsin, the substance that makes us see colours, and the cones and rods, the substances that make us see shapes. In order to transmit the signal to the brain and let us see the images, these substances cause complex processes of electrical impulses which, reaching the DNA of the neuronal cells, also irradiate and activate the biophotons within the same genetic chain. In short, biophotons would be responsible for the absorption of light in the human body, as that which occurs in photosynthesis for plants. It is then underlined that the light that we believe we see directly would no longer be just an external factor, but also an internal one, and would be produced in our brain. Reasoning as before, one could understand in this way how it is possible to dream an illuminated world during the REM phase of our dreams. So here, there would also be a link between light and DNA. But could the suggested practices by the Sarichina being and quantum biology really be effective for the development of new bonds and forms of DNA? This isn't clear. In any case, with an inquisitive eye, it was possible to confirm that quantum biology anticipates the Sarichina being's theory by a long way, since we are talking about academic studies carried out almost 100 years earlier. According to research carried out in recent years, triple-stranded DNA does exist and is a source of study on genetic development and solutions against diseases such as cancer. In fact, DNA would not only be double helix, as we have always been taught, but there would be DNA with multiple types of helix, including the triple helix. Let us give a brief example. On average, in DNA, the bond occurs between a purine and a pyrimidine, which are found on two opposite strands of the chain. However, it is not uncommon to have a strand of the double helix composed exclusively of purines, and this entails the possibility of grafting a third strand with the same polarity, i.e. purine with purine. These kind of interactions are called Hoogstein interactions. The existence of these non-canonical pairings was proposed in 1963 by Karst Hoogstein and they were experimentally observed for the first time only in 1974. So, what did the beings of Sarichina hide from us? We may never know, at least until someone tries to open the site again, finally laying eyes on the truth, at the risk and peril of all of us. Or, we can thoroughly analyse what we already know and demonstrate, as Ivomir Dimitchev also says, 
that there is knowledge that cannot disappear. Human beings and their time are inevitably connected to the light of the stars.